Good evening and welcome to Miami as we bring you Orioles 83, that magic feeling. We've been here for the last six weeks, since mid-February as a matter of fact. We've been here just as long as the Orioles have been. And while we've been here, we've found out who's hot, who's not, who's coming back with the Orioles, who the top rookies are. Lay back for the next hour and just watch as we let you in on what we have found out. As you watch Orioles 83, that magic feeling. That magic feeling is brought to you by Budweiser Light. The best never comes easy. That's why there's nothing else like it. And by B104, Baltimore's hot one, featuring money and the music every day. Mid-February in the city of Baltimore lies under the cover of a winter blizzard. Summer in the game of baseball seems light years away. But to the south and in Miami, the boys of summer have arrived. Easing from the dark shadows of a long winter and squinting their eyes into the South Florida sun, the players arrived for spring training 1983. Their gloves and muscles stiff from the winter layoff, they jog out onto the diamond to begin the early workouts. The Orioles came within one game of the playoffs last year, and they're loaded with veterans. But yet, 1983, a year filled with quite a few questions when they arrived at camp. Earl Weaver was gone, and the man replacing him was this smiling face, Joe Altabelli, who bounded out onto the field in a relaxed manner, sporting a chew and a grin, laughing and joking with his new chargers, many of which had played with him in the minor leagues. A stark contrast to the boot camp style of Earl Weaver. We wondered how the players felt about Joe's laid-back approach, so during the first week, we talked to several of the veterans. Well, first of all, it's real quiet. It's around here. It's not as noisy as it is without Earl yelling at you. I haven't been yelled at yet. It's, uh, it's, it's, I think Joe's going to be super. I mean, the thing is that we also have Ray, Ray Miller and Cal Ripken, you know, senior with us still. And, and those guys, you look up to them all. It's not, it's a, it's a kind of team that uh, no matter who's running it, we know what we're supposed to do. Earl's got us fundamentally sound. We've been here for six years now, and we still feel like kids, and we know what we're supposed to do. The matter is just going out and doing it. And uh, Joe's just not going to hurt us, that's for sure. And you mentioned Joe out the belly. First off, I think of a, a fine gentleman, you know, a good person. And uh, secondly, he's an excellent baseball man. I played for him in the minor leagues. We won uh, in 1971. I split the season. I was up and down quite a few times with the Orioles and in, uh, in Rochester. And we won the Little World Series under Joe. So, you know, if you give him some talent, he can make the best out of it. And also, uh, you know, his record proves that uh, he's going to be competitive regardless of what happens. As far as the, the game baseball goes, you know, he's, he's managing the minor leagues, he's managing the major leagues, and he's done an outstanding job. So as far as the baseball aspect goes, I'm sure you'll do a good job. Um, you know, uh, I think you can, you can you, uh, with Joe, you can sit down and talk to him. Sometimes, you know, with Earl, you know, you, you could talk, and he, he always invited you into his office, you know, to sit down and talk with him. But uh, sometimes, you know, at least personally, I, I left the office sometimes feeling like, like, you know, my point hadn't gotten across. But I think with Joe, you know, he's a man you can sit down and talk with him. Joe has an intense desire to win, the same as Earl did. Uh, the only difference, uh, it's the difference in two different guys. Uh, Joe is a taller man, number one, and Earl is a shorter man. Uh, Joe just goes about things a little bit differently, maybe, than Earl did. Uh, I guess Earl and I uh, are kind of more on the vociferous side, so to speak, and uh, Joe is a, a soft-spoken man. It's just the two, the two different people. Well, I think Joe probably knows a little bit more about pitching than uh, probably Earl does. Um, I think personally, as far as Joe's concerned, uh, you know, I like his style. I like Earl's style, too. But uh, it takes a while to learn Earl. And uh, after all these years, now he's gone. Now I know how he is. And we got along pretty well. But Joe, it's, he seemed to uh, relate to him a lot easier, I think. You know, not taking anything away from Earl, but uh, we're going to miss him. So under a new and quiet direction, the birds headed into the spring. There were several big stories to watch as spring training began, and we will focus in on them as the hour continues. In the outfield, the battle for center field loomed large. The veteran Al Bumbery facing a stiff challenge from promising young John Shelby. The shy and modest rookie spoke quietly, if at all, about the battle. I don't really see it as a battle. I don't know. I, I'd have to go along with just part of a growing experience. and I don't know. I guess just came up at a funny time, you know, and 
I don't know, it's, I guess there's been a lot of controversy between it and a lot of people like to classify it as a battle, but I don't know. I'm just in the spring training to try to make the team. As far as playing center field, I'm, I'm not you know, over concerned about, about that. I just feel that if I go out and play the way I'm capable of playing, then I anticipate playing. If I don't produce, then it's just like anybody else I don't play. In the infield, the big question mark, third base. And the Oriole Brain Trust put their money on young rookie Leo Hernandez. He of sound bat, but somewhat shaky fielding. But they made it clear from the start that it was his and he would have to play his way out of the position. But just in case, the Orioles bought some solid insurance in 36-year-old Aurelio Rodriguez, a weak bat, but smooth as silk in the field. And then among the pitchers, the burning question involved big Tim Stoddard and the condition of his knee. And he showed up in Miami with a strong knee and a positive attitude. I came down a little bit early, and I really didn't do a whole lot of throwing because of the weather. But, you know, I, I worked out a little bit, and it's a situation where I feel real good right now. It, uh, the knee still feels good when I'm throwing. The arm feels good. That's the biggest thing that's questioning me. I think the knee's going to be fine because my therapy and my recovery is really good. So I'm not too worried about the knee at all. I'm just worried about getting the arm and getting myself mentally ready. So everyone appeared to be ready and looking forward to working with new manager Joe Altabelli, even with some of those question marks hanging overhead. When we come back, we'll answer some of those questions as we talk with Joe Altabelli as he enters his first season as manager of the O's. than ever in Equitable Bank's Home Run Sweepstakes on Channel 2. If your Oreo player hits a home run during a sweepstakes inning, you can win from $1,000 to $1 million. Brooks, that's right, and you're automatically entered every time you use Equitable's 24-hour response banking machines or response banking phones. Or send us a postcard with your name and address. Equitable Bank's Home Run Sweepstakes during every Oreo's game on Channel 2. Enter and you could win a million dollars. A million dollars? Welcome back to Miami. With us now is Oriole manager Joe Altabelli. And Joe, the first training cramp with the Orioles is over. How did it feel? How did it go? I think everything went very, very well. I couldn't be happier with the way the players went about their business on a daily schedule. And I couldn't be happier with getting all our ball games in because we did have a lot of rain this spring. But nothing bothered us as far as getting rained out. When I talked to a lot of the guys at the beginning of the uh, training camp, they all talked about how laid back you are. They still say the, the, same, the same type of thing, Joe. They really love the approach. How does that feel? Well, I, I, all I do is observe anyway. I, was, I, I had to observe at least this spring, but uh, I didn't have anything to get on anybody about. Everybody went about their business. There was no one that was late. It was one of those camps that I remembered in the Oriole organization, and nothing seemed to change since last I left here. Is there anything uh, that you've tried to put in, tried to instill in these players this early, the Joel Tabelli style? I don't, uh, you know, I don't think so, because it's, it's a ball club that's been a winning ball club. I really don't want to take that away from them in any fashion or form. They've played very, very well in the past, and all I really want them to do is get in good shape down here and continue to do the same thing once the season starts, and that's win. Okay, now you've had some of these ball players before, some of them you haven't. Is there anything you've learned down here in the six weeks, something that has surprised you at all about any of the players? Well, other than the youngsters in the camp, there hasn't been any major surprises. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's been a, a real good camp. Everybody knows how to do how to do their job. Uh, Eddie Murray is, uh, is a guy that I kind of thought I had forgotten a little bit, but now that I've been around him, I can see, you know, an MVP behind his name and uh, a few other ball players. Bumbry, who had a bad leg uh, last year, played a month or two on a bad leg, came into this camp, works extremely hard, and now he's very sound. And it, it's, um, to me, it's good to see a guy like, like Al get, get to the work and taking care of himself the way he has been in this spring camp and work as hard as he does. What about some of the other guys who, like Bumbry, didn't have such great seasons last year who are fighting back, people like Singleton? Well, Kenny the same way. Kenny came in here, and last year he did have a, a, an off year, and a, his right arm was, uh, was not as strong as it might have been, but he came into this camp working all winter long on that, and he's hit a home run or two from the right side this spring. And that certainly makes everybody happy as far as uh, him coming back and being able to DH both from the left and the right side for us. 
Okay, you have a team that missed winning it all by one game last year. Uh, some people think they lost it on the first game of the, or the last game of the season. Most people tell you it was lost in the in the terrible start. What can you do to to ensure that the team gets out of the starting gate a little faster? I just think the reminder of that last ball game of a year ago would be enough. That's all I'd really have to say. Uh, in order to get off to a better start. But there's no ball player in this club that went into last season opening day or early in last year saying, well, if we lose today, we'll make up for it in September. I don't think a ball club does that. Uh, I don't know why uh, the Orioles have gotten off to slow starts. I did look over the record uh, in, in April over the last 10 years, and the Orioles are only nine games under 500 in a in a 10 year period in the last 10 years. I don't think that's disastrous. It's not as good as it is in uh, September. Their record in September is much better, of course. But nonetheless, I just don't feel that the ball club is going to get off to as slow a start as they might have last year. And besides that, when you do lose on the final day of the season, ball players on the team can look back and see five or six ball games that you could have won. The manager and coaches can look back and see 15 or 16 that you might have been able to win. So it just gets back at that. And uh, the other thing is, had the Orioles won, nothing would have been said about their poor start early in the year. They would have all been blaming Milwaukee for blowing it. But uh, that's the way it goes. And uh, now that the reminder is there, it might benefit us to get off to a better start in 1983. I'll tell you, Joe, uh, you talk to the people back in Baltimore who have been watching our reports and learning about the team, about you through the reports. Everybody seems to love you and seems to have high expectations about the, about the team. What can they expect? Well, I really don't want, you know, I don't want too many people to love me. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I don't want any ball players to love me. I just want them to go out there and do their job and win ball games. What about the fans, though, Joe? They're... they're um, they had a love affair with Earl Weaver, but you're a different different style. They're looking forward to your first day on Monday. Well, I'm sure they are, but again, if the ball players perform on the field and we win ball games, I'll get along just fine with the fans, I'm sure. Okay, Joe, what what might we see that's going to be different in this Oriole ball team from years past from from the Earl Weaver regime? I, I hope not too much. I really, you know, because the ball club has been a winner. That's exactly the way I want to keep them pointed. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, under not only my guidance, but the coaches as well, and the way they can perform, that will continue to do just that. And hopefully, rather than losing on the last day of the season, maybe we can relax and have fun on the last day of the season and have it cinched already as far as our division goes. Okay, uh, one other thing, you look around at the, the rest of the division, if anything, it's going to be even tougher than it was last year. The Yankees look stronger. Toronto, I mean, isn't going to team his challenge, but it's going to be tougher, and you have to play against those teams. Well, yes, but so does everybody else in the division have to play against one another. You're right. You're absolutely right. I see Toronto as a much improved ball club. I see Detroit and Cleveland the same way. Boston's always a tough ball club, especially in Fenway. And, of course, the Yankees, I believe, have bolstered themselves with two additions, Baylor and Kemp. And uh, I really feel that uh, Milwaukee will score runs, and uh, they may miss Vukovic, but they're still a run-producing ball club, and uh, they might just come up with a pitcher that can hold a club to less than five runs, but you know that Milwaukee has the capabilities of scoring five runs or better in any ball game they play. So it's not going to be easy, but we have a ball club that has not only... Uh, that type of run producing uh, uh, players but we also have the pitching that might stop the ball clubs that we pitch against from scoring those four and five runs what about the pitching staff when you look at it right now is it where you expected it to be at this time or even further ahead well absolutely we we, we have uh, 30 innings or better for all of our starters which was our goal before the spring started and our relievers have gotten a lot of work in too we we ended up playing 28 exhibition games, four B games, and three inter-squad games. That's, that's a total of 35 ball games, which is quite ample in spring training. And uh, In fact, it's more than ample. And uh, we're right on go. I like the starters. I like the relievers. It's just a fine ball club. Uh, we're about ready to start our season. Okay, Joe, thank you very much. We'll be back with more right after these again to Miami. With us, Joe Altabelli and Joe, the guys we want to talk about right now are some of these young players who've been shining like crazy during the spring. Well, I, I've seen a few, right? I tell you what, uh, John Shelby has been very impressive in our spring games, and uh, 
Not that Al Bumbry has done a real good job, too, and it's quite a tandem in center field for us. Uh, John can be used and, and do so many things. He's hit the ball hard as anybody in, in the spring games that I've seen so far, and uh, he's going to be a tough kid to stop, but he can be used so many ways for a ball club. I, I'm sure between the two of them, we're going to get a real healthy year in center field. Uh, Leo Hernandez at third base has done everything that we've expected and then some. Uh, the surprising thing about him is that he's played third base so well, not because of the plays he's made, but because he knows the position. He has a good feel for the position. Uh, he kind of reminds me of the Guerrero boy in Los Angeles with his power. He does have extremely good power, and if Leo can hit 25 or 30 home runs for us, we're going to have a robust hitting infield along with him alongside of Eddie Murray and um, young Cal Ripken Jr. So it it looks that good for us. And um, Storm Davis, another young pitcher, has done absolutely nothing wrong in our exhibition game so far. Has a lot of poise and a lot of promise. Not to mention some of the guys who, who didn't quite stick with the club but are going to be coming up. <laughs> right. Uh, a guy like Mike Young, to me, is going to be another Eddie Murray. He has extremely good power from both the left and right side. And he's going to have a, a brilliant future in the major leagues. And in about another year or two, he's going to start it because he just looks like he's on the verge of blossoming any minute. And it's a shame that, uh, you know, a guy like him has to go down, but it would also be kind of criminal to keep him on your bench. He needs to play in order to blossom. And, you never know. He might stay down at Rochester for 30 ball games, and we'll see him in about uh, a month from now, and he may never go back down again. Then we have a young catcher that we sent down shortly, uh, a short time ago, by the name of Al Pardo. Also a switch hitter. Also looks like he's going to be a good hitting catcher, and uh, uh, not too many clubs can boast of that fact. Uh, there was also another young catcher hitting left-handed by the name of John Stafaro that... Uh, looked very good in our camp so we're quite pleased with our catching and our youngsters and we also had a shortstop by the name of Rick Jones who played at Rochester last year but came into our camp and looks very very good um, he has the uh, the bat to be a good hitter whether he'll hit well or not it remains to be seen but nonetheless his shortstop capabilities are very very good okay Joe thanks again good luck this year and now let's go meet some of those rookies we've just been talking about most people don't think of John Shelby as a rookie. He became a household name at the end of last season when he came up in the stretch drive. He came to spring training locked in a battle with veteran Al Bumbry for the spot in center field. The spotlight, the press, and the pressure, and he has answered it all at the plate during the spring, giving the walls a workout at Miami Stadium. Midway through his tour at spring, the modest Shelby said he was just working to make the team like any other rookie. Same thoughts, same feelings. I'm not looking at it as to take Al Bumbry's job. My main goal down here is just to have a good spring and make the ball club. Some days Shelby was more than awesome. Like this Friday night against the Texas Rangers on March 24th, Shelby was perfect, five for five. He had three doubles and three RBIs. And how does John feel about his performance? I have no complaints. As we told you earlier, the third base job has been dropped into the lap of rookie Leo Hernandez in 83. His bat has been hot in the spring. His fielding has been somewhat erratic, but he remains confident that he can get the job done. And the young third baseman sat down with Hall of Famer Brooks Robinson to talk about his defense and his chance to make it in this organization. Yeah, I played four years two in minor league, and they never gave me a chance. You know, I got a good year every year, and when I hit, the, they give me, you know, they tried it from here to here. I'm very happy for because they, you know, I think I got more opportunity in this organization. Well, you had a big year last year, hitting 34 home runs in the minor leagues and driving in 118 runs. Uh, defensively, are you having any problems right now? Well, I, I, I'm playing with the ball, and I work a lot with my defense. And I think, it's, you know, I don't got no any problem with my defense, and I work hard every day in here in spring training. And I got a lot of confidence to myself, and I think I don't got no problem with my yeah. defense. Now on to the surprises. The talk of the year in Miami, rookie outfielder Mike Young. In quiet whispers, people watched the lanky Californian in the cage and called him the next Eddie Murray. He exploded on the front page of Sunday, March 20th, when he hit a sixth-inning grand slam home run to lead the Orioles past the Minnesota Twins. 
Then on the next day against the Atlanta Braves, Mike Young does it again. Two outs in the bottom of the ninth, and Mike hits a towering shot to right field. The outfielder loses it, but the ball finds its way over the fence, and the Orioles win it 8-6. to six. In an interview, Jack Dawson put the articulate rookie on the spot. New boss says you are a surefire major league prospect. Does that keep a little pressure on the shoulders, or do you just love to hear that stuff? Well, as far as pressure is concerned, no, it doesn't. It, you know, I'm not. If if I was to feel any pressure on me, you know, I think I wouldn't. You know, I think I wouldn't uh, be here right now. But you know, something like that from Alta Belly, you know, I, I think it's a plus. I consider myself a major league prospect, and you know, I've put a lot of time and devotion in, into my work and everything. So I, you know, I feel that if I keep it up, you know, good things will come. There were a couple of other rookies that caught the eye of the big leaguers this spring. Catcher Al Pardo is an Oriole farmhand who may well become the first homegrown catcher in the organization. On a trip to Tampa, his hometown, the youngster signed autographs and soaked up the big league atmosphere. Then he went one-on-one -on -one with big league announcer Chuck Thompson. Is this your first trip to a big league camp? Yeah, it is. Uh, what are your reactions? Any first thoughts? Uh, were you in awe of a lot of the people that you saw out there, the Singletons and the Bumbries and the Palmers? Well, they're just ordinary people. That's what I really uh, you know, noticed, and it's just a place to be. In other words, say, as a rookie coming to his first major league camp, they haven't kind of hazed you at all, have they? They haven't bothered you? No, no, not at all. They're really real nice fellows. And every year there seems to be a youngster that comes out of nowhere to become a big league prospect. This year's candidate, shortstop Ricky Jones, a Robin Yount lookalike with smooth hands and crisp bat. When he got in the games, he showed good range and a lot of toughness at short. But as he told our Jack Dawson, shortstop is going to be a tough place to break in with the Orioles. It's a little tough to be a shortstop on this club with uh, a wonderkind right ahead of you in there. Yeah, things really changed around last year. You know, that uh, before last year, there wasn't really a set shortstop, and now all of a sudden, Cal's there, so it's, it's going to be tough, yeah. What, what do you do now to uh, get yourself seen, heard, and into the majors? I just got to do, do the best I can, you know, down in Rochester or whatever, and, and get somebody to notice me, you know. Somebody to get me up to Baltimore somehow. The Orioles can consider themselves fortunate to have such a strong group of youngsters dreaming about making it to the big leagues. In fact, some of those guys have even realized that dream this year. But the core of any great baseball team is naturally their older guys. We'll be back in just a moment to take a look at some of the veterans. You look down the Oriole lineup, it is definitely a veteran squad. Most of these guys are near or over the age of 30, but like the old cliche says, they're not getting older, they're getting better. The clock keeps ticking away the years, but the Oriole veterans don't seem to notice. Steady Al Bumbry is 36 and can still whip a bat with the best of the youngsters. He had problems with his legs last year. Baseball talk calls it a bad set of wheels. But in the offseason, Bumbry worked to recap those wheels, and Jack Dawson talked with him about it. What did you do over the winter time to build those suckers up? I know you worked a little on them. Yeah, what didn't I do? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> exercise, I ran basketball machines. I used machines. Uh, um, I had had the, you know, my, I, I went and had my hamstrings checked out, and they were not very strong. So consequently, you know, the things I did this winter was primarily, you know, designed, you know, to help the hamstrings out. And I did a lot of work this winter. Uh, uh, I did more work this winter on my hamstrings than I have in the past. But in terms of, you know, me working out during the winter, I, I, that's what I'd always do. But this paid off because they feel great now. Ken Singleton turns 36 in June. A lot of people gave up on him last year when he had problems from the right side of the plate. In the offseason, he discovered a problem that caused a weakness in his right arm and went on a program to correct it. Chuck Thompson talked with Ken about his right-handed comeback. Uh, spring training for Singleton has been more or less, I think a lot of you understand, kind of a one-sided affair. More people are concerned about Ken Singleton as a right-handed hitter than they are about Ken Singleton as a left-handed batter. You had problems last year. What have you done? Well, I worked hard this winter, for one. I worked on the Cybex machine, and uh, if anybody out there has ever been on that machine, they know what kind of workout you can get on it. And uh, uh, I felt like putting a bomb under it after I left Baltimore. But uh, I worked hard, and I, it's really progressed. And if there were any lingering doubt that Ken Singleton was healthy, he answered it Sunday, March 20th, with this long home run to left field from the right side, and it looks like singing is back. 
closing in on the elder statesman is catcher Rick Dempsey. At 33, he should be on the downside, but you can't tell it from his spring performance. Here's Dempsey against the Twins. A triple deep to the right field corner, starting off a 9-4 Oriole win. And what about his arm? Well, watch him gun down speedy Rafael Ramirez of the Atlanta Braves attempting to steal. Second baseman Rich Dower is no spring chicken either, but at 31, he seems to have the heart of a young kid during spring training. So I asked him if he considers himself the class clown. Well, I just think it's playing with these 24 uh, mental midgets we have on this team here. It's the only way to keep sane. It's a, it's a fun club, and uh, you come out here and, uh, to play baseball, but um, you know, I think it's a game. It's always a game to me, and I have fun playing it, and I'll play, have fun at, as long as I can. And Dower can still go after them. Watch him rob Joe Morgan in this game against the Phillies. A little dirt never hurt anyone. A couple of youngsters that steal the spotlight from their elders are Eddie Murray and Cal Ripken. One word can describe the 24-year-old Murray, and that's superstar. This spring, he just picked up where he left off, continuing to establish himself as one of the premier players in the game today. And he told us he still thinks there's room for improvement each year. Well, sure, you're always trying to improve, but, you know, the way I've been doing it so far, uh, and I think I continue to do it, which is uh, I just look at the season as an overall, and I try and attack it that way instead of uh, maybe setting numbers, which uh, could be a little hard to get to at times. And the baby of the starting nine is shortstop Cal Ripken, Jr. Cal, a mere 22, is rookie of the year in 82. And the question he heard all winter as he toured the banquet circuit was, what about the dreaded sophomore jinx? Well, I guess everywhere I went, I probably heard it... Uh, I always say that I don't believe in the sophomore jinx because uh, the pitchers know you, but but you know the pitchers as well. So I feel if you can adjust to uh, to their strengths and they're trying to exploit your weaknesses, then if you can adjust, then you can avoid the sophomore jinx. And uh, so I guess it's going to be a period of adjustment for me next year. But for the most part, the Oriole veterans are on the shady side of 30. John Lowenstein is 36, and so is Terry Crowley. Jim Dwyer is 33. Benny Ayala is 32, Dan Ford is 31, and Len Sakata is 30. Well, Gary Renicki will turn 29 later this year. That's definitely a lot of experience, and it holds true for the pitchers as well. The veterans are the core of the staff. When we come back, Scott Garceau will talk with pitching coach Ray Miller about his boys, and we'll have more from Miami right after this. of the veterans on this Oriole team, they have one of the most experienced pitching staffs in all of baseball. Here's Scott Garceau with more on that. There are several reasons why the Orioles have been consistent contenders over the years, but probably the most important, pitching. The man in charge of the Oriole arms, pitching coach Ray Miller. Yeah, I've been real optimistic this spring, uh, Scott, right from the get-go because uh, all our pitchers did more throwing prior to coming here than they ever have. They were in Baltimore. We've got the new tunnels, and uh, Elrod, my good old buddy Elrod, had everybody in the bullpen uh, or down in the tunnels throwing before they come here. So when they got here, their uh, their arm strength was twice as good as uh, it's ever been before. And uh, something about losing the last day of the season, I know for myself and, and for each pitcher and for everybody on the ball club in particular, we all kind of thought back and uh, some of the things I could have said or did or each pitcher could have done one thing different or one thing better or one fundamental better and it just seems to be an overall um, more aggressive and solid approach to uh, the way we go about doing our fundamentals and our conditioning here and I've been uh, really optimistic and happy the way they work they run better this spring than I've ever seen them run thumbnails on particulars now let's start with Jim Palmer Jimmy, uh, he's had a few nagging pains uh, that you're going to get when you've won 20 games eight times and uh, two times Cy Young and all that. But uh, uh, physically, he is pitching much better. Um, it's, it's a funny thing to say. You know, a guy's won 263 games, and last year he was 15 to 5. I said that he had pitched better or made a transition into a true pitcher, and that's a terrible thing to say about a guy that's won 263 <laughs> games. But prior to last year, he wouldn't throw a slider to a left-handed hitter. He wouldn't throw his changeup to a right-handed hitter. Uh, after his um, 
uh, odyssey to the bullpen, and when he come back, he started doing those things. He started just taking whatever he had on a given day and using all four pitches to pitch, and uh, he put together a heck of a streak and carried us down through a, a really tough stretch. In fact, a couple times that we were wiped out, Jimmy come in and the next day and picked us up and put us back in the picture. Uh, he started out right from the, sp the first day of spring training here, throwing uh, change-ups to right-hander, sliders to left-hander, moving the ball around. He's got uh, he's leading the club in strikeouts in spring training, and he's pitched about 27 innings, and then probably uh, by opening day he'll have uh, more than 30 innings, which is what we try to get all the starters to get. So I'm real happy with you. Your veteran left-handers, uh, Scotty McGregor and Mike Flanagan. Scotty. Uh, I've always favored, thought Scotty is one of the best pitchers I've ever seen when he's on top of his game. And he's had nothing but success at the major league level uh, prior to last year uh, and relatively injury free other than a little bit of pains early in the year for the last couple of years. Uh, last year he had arm problems. Uh, he couldn't pitch the way he wanted. And he's made a little bit more dedication to uh, train himself in the offseason. He's gone about it a little bit more aggressively this year. And he's healthy. He's done everything that we've asked him to do. Uh, he's spotting the ball where he wants to. Uh, he's been out here a couple times in games where he's uh, faced a minimum amount of hitters. And uh, as everybody else, he's had a couple of rough spots, too. But as long as Scotty's healthy, I know I can have one of the better left-handers in baseball. How about Mike? Mike Flanagan is, uh, I thought, during the 1982 season, made the transition back to becoming a power pitcher uh, because he'd had the injuries in 81 and 82, that, uh, or 80 and 81, that had taken away the power part of the pitching. He had learned to finesse a little bit and change speeds and turn the ball over. Uh, the transition back to a power pitcher, now he's healthy. He's throwing the ball in 88, 89, which is right back where he was in his Cy Young year, except during the course of that time that he was spotting the ball, he learned to turn the ball over and come up with what I, it's almost an excellent screwball, although I don't want to call it a screwball because I want him to remain a power pitcher. But he's developed this other pitch, which means that on a given day, if he, don't, if he doesn't get his curveball over, he can still pitch very well, and, and I'm quite excited about that. Uh, in fact, uh, his last time out in, uh, um, down here, uh, he went to first three innings and kind of struggled a little bit with the curveball and, and uh, filed the curveball and went back to power pitching and, and made a, uh, a correction in midstream in the third inning and threw three shutout innings. And uh, I was quite excited about that. He's a workhorse and he's healthy. So uh, we're good in that area too. Dennis. Dennis, uh, everybody keeps saying, what year is Dennis going to be a great pitcher? Well, you win 16 a year, that's a pretty good pitcher. There's a lot of teams in baseball that would give anything to have four guys win 16. Uh, Dennis has worked very hard at holding runners down here this spring, and he's worked uh, quite a bit on uh, his pitch selection and, and uh, being a little bit more aggressive against the 7, 8, 9 type hitter, the, guy, the kind of guy that uh, I think in the last two years he's thrown too many breaking balls to. He hasn't been aggressive with. So far this spring, he's been much more aggressive. He's throwing 65, 70% uh, fastballs and he's working much faster between pitches, which will make everybody happy. <laughs> Your young phenom, Storm Davis, who did uh, so much last season. Well, he certainly didn't uh, let success go to his head because he come in here just as hungry this spring as he did last spring, and the man is really working hard, and uh, he's trimmed down. Uh, we always kid him about being a cyclone. We call him... Uh, you know, Mike was Mike Flanagan was called uh, Cy, uh, Cy New, and Jimmy was Cy Old, and and uh, then uh, Steve Stone was Cy New, and so last year Flanagan called Davis Cy Clone because he apparently uh, visually looks a lot like Palmer. He's a handsome kid, but he come in this spring, and I think he's got zero body fat. He's just eliminated all uh, body fat. He's in excellent condition. He's showing the ball. Uh, consistently in the 90s. He's learned to change up. He's learned to slider. Uh, he spots his curveball in right spots. He holds runners very well. He just does uh, He does things that you you expect a veteran 27, 28-year-old or 30-year-old pitcher to do. He's doing it at the age of 21, and uh, he stays healthy. I can't see why he can't become one of the premier pitchers in Oriole history. The bullpen, uh, s some question marks, I guess, with uh, Tim Stoddard. Sammy Stewart has had a, a, a rough spring, ha had an injury problem. Uh, how do you look out there? Well, the only thing about the bullpen last year, uh, people talked about the bullpen early in the year. The bullpen was a problem early in the year, but the problem was that the starters were, were leaving the ball game in the fourth and fifth inning. When that happens, you end up uh, really overloading the bullpen to counteract that this spring just to make sure that our starters... Uh, before we knew that our starters were completely healthy, just to make sure we've, we've got more innings in for the relievers than they've ever got. Uh, I think the most, uh, for example, Tippy Martinez, the most innings he ever pitched down here was 14. Uh, using B games and every game we can, we've got him at about 16 now, and we're looking for about 21 before we leave here. Uh, Stoddard has been on an every other day program for the last seven or eight days, and uh, 
throwing one inning a day. And, and uh, Are you satisfied with his progress? I'm real satisfied. He's throwing 90. He's uh, working completely out of the stretch to eliminate the long windup where he had been pulling some muscles. He just throws out of the stretch all the time. Uh, he's done everything we want him to do. He's run hard. Uh, he walked into spring training the first day, and he said, I read about the things in the paper that maybe the Orioles were looking for another short man. He says, you walk upstairs right now and tell them they don't need one. <laughs> and uh, I've been quite excited about that. He's been dead serious. He's been mean. Um, he's he's uh, pitched in a little bit more in spring training and scouted a few people when they got up off the ground and uh, a lot of things that he's all business. So, uh, on the other hand, Tippy's pitched more innings and Tippy hasn't had a real successful spring. He's had some rough spots, but um, that's always a problem with Tippy because he throws his curveball so hard. He throws his curveball 83, 84, 85 miles an hour during the season, which is as hard as most people's fastball. And it takes a long time to get that release point down. And that's why I'm excited about getting him as many in as we can and getting the dead arm period and the soreness out of the way here so that when we go north, he'll be ready to go. Don Welchel has to be uh, the surprise of the camp. He hasn't allowed an earned run yet and, and uh, creates a, a, pre a pleasant problem, I guess, for people who have to do things like cut rosters. But uh, your impression of his work well he certainly jumped to the front uh, <clears throat> not only because he hasn't given up a run this spring and, and everybody's pitched pretty much the um, equal amount of innings of the guys that were considered for the ninth job but he hasn't given up a run but he's just shown excellent stuff all the way uh, quite a competitor quite a good sized guy very deceptively fast he's a he's a big kid with a nice smooth motion and it, it, it appears that he's an average type thrower and yet you read the radar gun and it's 89 90 91 consistently we had a meeting today a front office meeting with our farm director and hank peters our, our uh, general manager and everything and and i interrupted the meeting to tell our farm director if he can just drop a storm davis and the welch along me every spring that i could stay here for a long time Ray, what about your role this year with Joe Altabelli? Will it change at all? Do you, do you expect to be more involved? Uh, the, the Earl, of course, had his uh, opinions, and Joe has his. Uh, what have you noticed up to this point? Well, Joe and I go back a long way, Scott, and, and uh, I'm, I was really pleased that he ended up being the manager. I know myself and the Cal Ripken Sr. Uh, we're in, in running for the job, and, and I would have been happy either way that way. Uh, if we went outside for anybody, I wouldn't have been happy because there's such a charisma and attitude on this ball club that takes years and years to develop. And I wanted to make sure that whoever took over the club uh, could appreciate that and understand that. Well, lo and behold, Joe got into the picture, and I'm real happy because he was sort of my mentor, the, the guy that got me started into coaching. He taught me all the basics in coaching, uh, patience in coaching, and, and the um, the way to analyze a person and the timing take to be to be a good coach. He got me started on all this, and uh, now I'm back with him, and he's leaning on me for all the knowledge he can get about our pitchers, our ball club. Uh, uh, the American League, how each guy pitches against each guy, and also he's, he's let me schedule the pitching down there, and, I, and I'm, I'm really excited about that because for the first time we've got more innings for everybody than we've ever had. It's a very balanced thing. Anybody that's in competition for a job has the same amount of innings as, as his competitor, and I, I feel that uh, who doesn't make, whoever doesn't make this ball club that goes back to the minor leagues will have more innings pitched will be more prepared to pitch at Triple A season and therefore can get to a better start there. And if we need some help, we'll get them. How do you envision the rotation in the early part of the season? Well, with everybody healthy, we're going to go Palmer, uh, Palmer, Flanagan, McGregor, uh, Martinez, not necessarily in that order, but those four guys, because lifetime they have a 607 win percentage in the American League. And uh, I said all spring, everybody says, oh, you question about that ninth man, it must be tough. It's certainly not as tough as other major league clubs that uh, they'll name their first two starters and say they have a group of six candidates for their next three. Well, we're naming our first four starters they have a 607 win percentage in, in the big leagues, and that's a great feeling. With Storm Davis being a, uh, probably the fifth man, but working out a long run relief early in the year until the schedule gets to where we're playing consecutive days. Uh, Storm Davis and Sammy Stewart going every other day as a lawman will give us two quality major league starters for every ball game. Uh, and if the, the four starters and those two guys can can uh, keep tipping and started in the bullpen until the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning, we're going to win a lot of ball games. And uh, I'm just happy that everybody's healthy. The attitude of the ball club and the pitching staff is just phenomenal. And uh, I can't wait to get started. At what point uh, do you see perhaps a five-man rotation? Well, I, I forget the date uh, right now. I believe it's like uh, March 17th or it's like the uh, 28th game or 29th game. I'd have to look at the schedule, but you can see the off days involved in the travel days and all that. And then the weather breaks. You also miss a lot of days because of weather. But the weather usually breaks about the uh, um, middle of May and uh, 
hopefully uh, when we start playing those, uh, again, it won't be a consistent five-man rotation. What we're going to try to do is get the pitchers working with four days rest at all times. So when the uh, when an off day comes along, then the fifth man will drop and the other four guys will work. The fifth man will we'll go back to the bullpen for a couple of days. And it's pretty much what we've done in the past. What we haven't done in the past is uh, we line up four guys to pitch down there, then go north and try to pitch two and use the other two in the bullpen. And I really don't favor using starters in the bullpen. I know you see it, you've seen it yourself every fall. Uh, in the, you get down to the last game of the playoffs or the, the last game of a pennant race, and the team is losing and goes to the bullpen and brings in three starters to try to save the game, and it just never seems to work. And what I'd like to do and what Joe wants to do is to line those four guys up and they'll pitch every fourth game. And so, therefore, if there's any amount of time left, it'll be left to everybody as opposed to putting one guy out with 10 days rest and having the other two working with four. Let's digest all of this on a 1 to 10 scale as you break camp here. Where would you say your pitching staff is? Well, if 10's the top, uh, I'll take it. I'll take his pitching staff anywhere in baseball, National League or American League. So that's the way Ray Miller sees his pitching staff. Jim Palmer was scheduled to start tomorrow in the opener. He still has a little bit of a problem with his back, so Dennis Martinez will step in instead and start his second straight season opener. He'll be up against Larry Gura. We'll have more from Miami right after this. six weeks, but it's been well worth it. We've learned a lot about the Orioles and hopefully brought you a little bit closer to them. But before we go tonight, let's go back one more time and take a lighthearted look of the spring of 83. Welcome to Key Biscayne, Florida, and I say welcome because over the next several weeks, we're going to do our best to try and make you feel like you are actually here. We arrived yesterday. This is where it all began. Yours truly on our very first day of coverage in front of our Key Biscayne home away from home for six weeks of camp. It was an enjoyable stay for us during spring training as we tried to bring back the flavor of South Florida you in our daily reports. So now let's wrap things up by looking back at some of the more memorable or some of the more forgettable moments during the spring of 83. Remember the last day of pitchers and catchers together before the rest reported? A rare sight. Tim Mighty Casey Stoddard takes his turn at bat in a one-eyed cat game and goes down swinging. And when things got boring, we turned to Sammy Stewart to liven it up with his circus tricks. Bring out Barnum and Bailey. We got a chance to meet a lot of the fans who come out to the ballpark. Fans of all sizes, shapes, and age. Like the Cowan brothers, Henry and Lewis, who've been coming out to the games for 40 years. Or 86-year-old Steve Horm, a favorite of many of the players. And we met a group of ladies from Baltimore out to catch up with a few of their favorite Orioles. I was a baseball widow. And uh, he watched the boob tube every night, you know, and every afternoon. And so finally, one day, he said, I'll take you out to the game. That was it. I got hooked that day. And then you get hooked on a player. And one by one, I got hooked on the players. <laughs> and uh, right now, it's Dempsey. <laughs> One thing we noticed while spending a lot of time on the sidelines at spring training is that just about everywhere you look, you see jaws bulging with chewing tobacco. A chaw, as the players refer to it. I figured if that many guys thought it was a good thing, then I should get in on it also. So I decided to give it a try with Ray Miller's help. I've been chewing ever since I was in baseball, and, and uh, I really don't think it's a dis disgusting habit, but I think Harvey King kind of set us back a few years on World <laughs> Series last year. <laughs> no doubt about that. Well, I'm trying it out. It's not too bad. I guess the, the main thing to remember, though, is that you don't want to swallow when you have this in your mouth. Because it could cause you some problems. I guess that, that's right, John. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I suppose if he could say it, this is John Saunders for New Scene 2. But I wasn't the only one to make a fool out of himself on camera this spring. The Orioles' Rick Dempsey joined our ranks as a reporter and found out quickly why we carry a lot of extra tape with us. I think this is take 68. Thank you. Okay, this is Rick Dempsey with New Scene 2, Miami Orioles Stadium. <laughs> oh, it's still pretty crummy, but... Yeah. <laughs> like the old impression. Well, thank you, Mike. I know some of the questions I asked you are a little tough to answer, but we did good. <laughs> but Rick did finally get it down right. Watch the old pro at work in this story with trainer Ralph Salvon. 
So when we have problems, we call on the big fella, Ralph. Ralph, my back is kind of sore. Can you crack it for me, please? Yeah, we can take care of that. Okay. You remember the times in the restaurants in New York when you come behind me and take my potato yeah. out of my plate? Well, yeah. I'm going to get eaten. Oh, Ralph, we're going to have to work on 20 more. This is Rick Dempsey News Scene 2. <laughs> Nothing to it, right, Rick? A lot of the embarrassing moments came on the field as well. Here's what happens when the wind picks up to about 35 miles per hour as it did on this day in Tampa against the Reds. Len Cicada is under the pop fly. I got it. I've got it. I think I've got it. No, I haven't got it. Good grief, Charlie Brown. And the Is This the Big Leagues award goes to Atlanta Braves outfielder Lionel Vargas. Two outs in the ninth inning and Mike Young sends it high to right field. Vargas camps under it and waits. Only the ball knows for sure. No one in the stadium sees it go out except for our camera. And Vargas is still looking for the ball to come down. Uh, Lionel, you want to find a rock to hide somewhere? But somehow I can sympathize with him, especially since I ended up in an Oriole uniform in an attempt to see what it was like to be an Oriole. pretty good, but my hopes were quickly dashed by manager Joe Altabelli. How'd I do? How do I look? The bat is a little slow. A little slow? The speed is very slow. <laughs> and your arm, one under, one over. <laughs> No, what is, I mean, is, is that my uh, contract? That means, uh, <laughs> that means I'll see you Friday night at 11 o'clock. <laughs> Make sure you're there. Because right. you don't want to lose that job, son. That's a good one. Yeah. Right. Think of another good one. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Wait, right. take it easy. Right. Bye. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. But just remember, if you need any help on the hot corner this season, you know where to find me. Well, that wraps up coverage of the spring of 1983. Be sure and tune in tomorrow as we kick off coverage of the season of 83. It'll start at noon with Scott Garceau out at Memorial Stadium with live reports throughout the game, and we'll end it at 11.30 with a half-hour special on opening day. Thanks for watching, and goodbye from Miami. Orioles 83, that magic feeling, has been brought to you by Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud's for you. And by B-104, Baltimore's Hot One, featuring money and the music every day.
McDonald's win $800 to nothing. Don't you mean eight to nothing, Chuck? Not during McDonald's Big Mac Attack sweepstakes, Channel 2 and McDonald's give you a chance to score big with the birds. During every televised game, a contestant will be eligible to win $100 for every Oreo run scored if the birds win, or $50 an Oreo run if they lose. To enter, stop by a participating McDonald's and fill out an entry form and enter each week to increase your chances to win. No purchase is necessary. McDonald's Big Mac Attack sweepstakes gives everybody a chance. Magic was there, but...